welcome back to Cracking the Cryptic. And um, yes, Peter C, we are going to do a classic today. Now, uh, as I was doing the recentest Gast video, um, there was this fantastic puzzle by Philip Newman that I think was one that he had not put in his pie pack. And it was basically um, a set of the digits, the significant digits of pi, put in a Sudoku grid in a symmetrical pattern and making a classic Sudoku that was uh, genuinely approachable. It was part of the gas series and it really was a very approachable classic Sudoku. And that reminded me that, of course, Philip had created this Pi Day pack and we did mention it, I think, and give a link at the time. I'll give another link in this video, but uh, in the description field. But in this Pi Day pack, there are a lot of Pi themed puzzles, including, I think, three classics. This is the hardest of them. And uh, I do want to try it on the channel because I haven't, I didn't try it. I tried the first puzzle in the pack. I didn't try any of the others, but it was a really interesting looking pack. It was literally just because of time, not because of disinclination. I think Philip's ability to, I'm going to have to use the word discover these patterns is incredible, but the point about this puzzle is it's a classic Sudoku, but look at the digits as they appear in the grid in order. 3.141592653589732384625. And like me, you you will also have memorized the first 22 significant digits of pi. No, I haven't really. And in fact, while I was talking, I was trying to count them up in the grid. But anyway, um, it's amazing that this can turn into a properly difficult classic Sudoku puzzle. I don't, you know, I know Philip's obviously using a computer to discover these, but it's incredible that he is able to do it. I just love it that this can exist. Um, and basically, I'm going to try another one, therefore. You know, I did one of these yesterday. I'm going to do another one today. Uh, yes, Peter C comments regularly in capitals, please do more classics. And uh, I'm afraid we don't take more notice of you because it's in capitals. I think uh, it's widely considered that's not the done thing. And nobody else seems to do it in the comments. So uh, anyway, um, actually, it does remind me of the last time somebody else made a comment in capitals was about the use of the term Mexican standoff in one of our Patreon puzzles, where somebody wrote to us to say, in capitals, surely the fact that it might be considered offensive by some is enough not to use this. And I thought, well, surely the fact that using capitals is considered offensive by some might be enough to not use them. But um, the irony would probably have been lost on the commenter. And uh, actually, that reminds me of another... <laughs> This is more unbelievable, and I, I think I may have been the victim of a practical joke, but somebody wrote about the magpie's use of words that that they didn't like. If the magpie doesn't understand what an offensive word is, they can just F star star K off. And I thought, well, I'm not sure you understand what an offensive word is, but anyway, that was that was a while ago. Um It just it just tickled me that uh that a tweet uh, using that language was complaining about the words that we were using in crosswords, uh, which weren't, in my opinion, anything like as offensive, but obviously tastes differ. Now, sorry, that's all digression. Um, I will digress further to mention the links under the video, which should include the pie pack today, the pie day puzzle pack from Philip, or a link to where it is in Discord at least. Um, as well as our Patreon content, there's uh, the uh, April challenge out there now, three times a Sudoku, and um, getting lots of correct answers to that now. And uh, yeah, loads going on as usual. We've got all our apps, merchandise, some of those updated lately, and Sven's Sudoku pad going very well on Steam. Anyway, check it all out and the links under the video. But this puzzle, I don't have to explain the rules because you know them already. One to nine appear in each row, column, and three by three box. It's called Pipeline with pi spelt with a Greek character, of course. And I'm going to let me let me start the clock so I know how long it takes me. I'm going to start now. So we've got ones here. 
that give us a one in box one straight away, um, and a three in column three. That must be there. So what else does that give us? That gives us a seven. Must be in one of those two cells because it can't be down here. Now, what else do we get? We get a five in one of those two. I'm seeing those fives. Basically looking at the shoots of three boxes at the moment to see what we get. Nine must be in one of those two cells. These corner marks mean that a, a digit is restricted to a couple of places within a box, but three isn't here. Three is only in that cell in box eight. Um, and then if I go for center marks in a cell, that'll indicate that that cell only has uh, certain candidate possibilities. Two actually is restricted there, so in there also. Oh, across the middle, six can only go in that place. So that places it in row six. That's a useful strong pattern because anything like that two is looking down at those three cells. Now two must be in one of those two and that rules it out of this one. So we've placed two in box five. There'll be a two over here somewhere as well. Seven must be up there. Six, eight, nine, five, two, three, and in one of those two. Uh, one of these is an eight. I don't know which one. Three, four, two, five. Ah, eight is restricted to those two cells. They make an interesting pattern ruled out of box nine. Not very helpful. I'm not going to mark the three possible eights there, although I might later. Six is confined to those places in box one. Oh, and five only has two cells as well. So box one's interesting. Um, three, four, six, seven, five, three, six, five. Oh, one of, oh, three. I should have kept going with three once I got that one. It's placed here too. And then in one of those two. Oh, no, that gives us three here. That fixes seven. There's one more three in the grid. There it is. They're all done. This is now a one, four, two triple. Um, we sometimes call this a chocolate teapot triple because it's not very useful, frankly, uh, until we get one of them disambiguated. But the rest of the row is done. Uh, one, four, seven along there. I'm going to pencil mark that. Because uh, these are the candidates, yes. I've gone for the centers of cells when I'm just limiting the candidates. Nine and two are there. That is four or eight, and that is one, four or eight. Oh, two. Look at this. This has been available from the beginning. That I can place a two there. That meant I didn't need to pencil mark twos. That gives me nine there. I'm not sure how hard this puzzle actually is, really. That's no doubt going to bite me in the backside in a moment as a comment. Three, two, nine, eight, two, three, eight, four. Yeah, as soon as I said that, everything grinds to a halt. That is the way of the world. Six, three, eight, four, two, five, eight. I'm do feel, oh, this box has some limitations. Six must be in one of those two cells. One and nine, are limited there. Maybe box three, one, five, three. Two is in one of those two. And nine, actually, that is a pair. That's a weird offset pair because of 9, 2 being there and there, and ruled out of all of those cells, consequently. Now, I'm going to mark these other cells, 4, 6, 7, 6, 7, 8. Oh, that was not helpful. I thought I was going to get everything down to something better than that. No. Um, 3, 4, 2, 6, 5, 8, I've got marked. Um, right, five is in one of those two. Five, two. Hmm, I mean, still doing quite basic Sudoku techniques at the moment. I haven't done anything very elaborate, and I'm kind of hoping not to have to, but 
are, let's bear in mind, five and seven are in those two, so in those three cells somewhere. They must be both amongst them because that cell can't be five or seven. So actually that can't be a seven. And in fact, this cell can't be five or seven. It also sees one, six, three, eight, and two. So that's four or nine. And this one only has two possibilities, seven or nine. I mean, I'm, yeah, I've got to the state. This is kind of what you do when you get stuck in a Sudoku. You, you start pencil marking potentially interesting cells that might yield X wings or or other patterns that that could be useful, and that is the stage I've got to now. This clearly isn't a sort of gas type classic where you can just fly through the rest. We're going to have to find something here, and basically going to have to look up at consequences of actions. I would think, uh, and I'm not really finding very much. Nine can't be there. Nine in this row has to be in one of those two cells, but I'm I'm not marking that across boxes. I might just try and bear it in mind as useful. Hmm. Yeah, I would find it difficult to read my pencil marks if I was marking in rows across boxes. So I'll try and keep them minimalist so I can understand what I'm looking at in this grid based on my familiarity with classic Sudokus, that's kind of how I have to go about it. That is just five or seven. This one, I think, is only six or eight. Up here, five, six or eight. So, no, I don't know. It doesn't give me much across the top. Oh, that can't be four. Four is actually confined to just one of those two positions. Now, if that wasn't the four, if that was eight, that would make this the four. Oh, this is lovely. This is lovely. Look, if that was eight, I'm just going to color it so you can see where I'm looking. If that was eight, you get a four here. Now that sorts out this triple in a way that puts two in this cell, sorry, in the middle cell here. If you get a four there, look at that triple, that's where two is going to have to go. And that's really interesting because now you've got a four here and a nine here. And that's exploded this cell completely off the grid. It's meant it's unfillable. So if you were to put an 8 in that, as a very quick consequence, you get 4 there, 1, 2, 9, bang, you're dead. So that is a great spot, actually. I'm pleased with that. That can't be an 8. That is therefore where the 4 does go. Um, and that fixes this triple the other way possible. That's not a 4, we know that. So 2 there is fixing the 9-2 pair at the top. That fixes this other cell we picked up, 7 there. That becomes a 5. This is now not where 7 goes in the middle. It must go in the central cell. Um, has this fixed everything? Oh, it places 2, yes, of course, in that box. That is now a 4-9 pair at the top and a 6-8 pair below. This has become a 7 for all sorts of reasons. We can fill in 6 and 9 down here. Take out the pencil mark. This is a 1-7 pair that I can't resolve. This 5-8 pair is resolved. That can't be 8 or 9 now. That's a 7. That looks back and fixes the 1-7. That has finished column 2. I think we could be getting to the end suddenly. And, well, I mean, it's a good... It's a good um, advocate, this puzzle, for this strategy of kind of picking up the basic deductions and then doing some pencil marking to figure out what might be interesting to look at. I mean, that's really, it's not, it's not genius advice. It's just practical advice, basically, on solving the more difficult Sudokus. This isn't absolutely rock hard. We basically needed one interesting deduction based on the fours there. But it is an interesting result of that. I'll tell you what I'll do, actually. I will just pause for a moment, and that is the finish, and there is the solution. And I'll check what a Sudoku solver makes of this puzzle, and, uh, and I'll get back to you on that. And that 
Yeah, that was really interesting. So I know that Andrew Stewart's solver, although it has stood the test of time and it's a very clever solver and it apes human techniques to an extent, is maybe not the cutting edge these days. But when I put this puzzle into that, it did most of the early stuff. I think almost exactly the same as, as I did it, probably in a different order. But um, then rather than finding this sort of chain of five cells, it did some extraordinary thing called um, an X cycle, then another X cycle, then an X Y wing, and then some other diabolical strategies. Things that I don't, I don't even understand what they are. It was eliminating one out of five or six candidates in cells, and eventually came up with something to to break through. And I don't even think it was in this box; it was somewhere else. So it was a really yeah, I mean, I think this is one where where humans can triumph over computers. It's, or, well, as I say, Andrew Stewart Solver's maybe not the cutting edge solver at the moment. Um, I think Ransk has a very good one, for instance, and uh, there may be others around that, that do come up with human techniques rather better. But certainly, yeah, I feel quite pleased to have done it in a in a different and I think, frankly, neater way than than a computer this time. But there we go. Um, anyway, I hope that appeases some of you who want more classic Sudokus. Effectively, that's three over the gas video in this one. But uh, there we go. I do like doing classics and it's worth keeping a hand in to the basic techniques all the time anyway. So thanks for watching. Hope to see you again soon on the channel. Bye for now.